Uh, I give you over to this wonderful class, these great teachers who have been doing such heroic work the last few weeks and their incredibly trying circumstances. Um, and things are winding down, and so it's a great time. Maybe, they'll, maybe they will have some time for some thumb twiddling now. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you all for, for coming, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, my plan for today is just to show you some, something that I think is fun uh, for you to enjoy. Um, it's, it's kind of a solitary activity that you can share that I've been doing since I was a kid. I don't remember exactly when I invented this, but I've taught this in various settings, like in a university auditorium with hundreds of people and one-on-one uh, -on -one to many people. It's, it's totally useless. It's just something fun, hopefully, that will sort of take your mind off all the stresses uh, of, of the world at the moment. Um, so it's a generalization of thumb twiddling. So I'm twiddling my thumbs. Um, <clears throat> I have you all in view everybody array mode. So if you can all show me that you can twiddle your thumbs, um, then I'll feel that this is sort of an interactive class. Sam, I don't see you higher. Okay. Okay. I, that sounds pretty good. All right. Now let's we'll take it up a notch. Can you go backwards? Reverse direction. So go forwards and backwards. All right. That's basically it. Easy peasy. Okay. Mathematicians love to generalize. Whenever a mathematician learns about something, they try and think of the most sort of abstract way to make it apply to more things to try to forget the surface and go sort of deeper and see deeper structures. So if we wanted to generalize thumb twiddling, one thing you might think of is someone shout out an answer. The universe. That's pretty general. What's a little more general than thumb twiddling. What would be a variation? Circles. Circles. All right. No, well, not. this is one of those cases where the Socratic method does not get you to what the teacher is trying to get you to. What I'm thinking of is I could twiddle some other finger. I mean, it's just as useless. I can twiddle my index fingers or pointer fingers. I can go forwards and backwards. I can pick any of the five fingers. I can twiddle pinkies or go backwards. Not very exciting, but it's one step of generalization. And this is sort of how real mathematicians work. They think of something that they understand a little bit about, and they try and pose a bigger and a bigger question. And then they sort of challenge themselves and they see, make, make a hypothesis, see if they can disprove it, whatever. Anyway, so we could say, I, I can twiddle any one of my fingers. Great. Math, real mathematics, when mathematicians are working on things, um, is not looking to, um, to, to go anywhere in particular, they're just sort of exploring. Okay, what if we wanted to twiddle two fingers at once? I could take two fingers, like thumbs and my pointers, at the same time, and I could do something like this. Can you see what I'm doing? Oh, actually, I'm going to try black shirt and see if my white fingers on black shirt is clear. Okay, so that's a kind of a generalization. All of a sudden my sound has gotten very quiet. Okay. Did you people hear me? Did my speakers fade out? Hello? You're, you're, you're okay. quite scratchy. Okay, the, at least I hear you. I'm not sure. It's just everyone's being so quiet. Okay, so that's a two-finger generalization of thumb twiddling. Sounds good. If you think of what's happening, both fingers are sort of going around the same way. They're both going, the thumb is going clockwise around the other thumb, or the index finger is going clockwise around the other index finger. They're both going the same direction. Whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise depends on whether you sort of look from the right side or from the left side, but they're both the same. So here's a puzzle. Can I have my thumbs go clockwise, and my index fingers go counterclockwise. Impossible. <laughs> so here's the way I would do it. And now here's where it turns out that the rubber band, I think, helps. So I'm hoping some of you have found a handy dandy rubber band. And uh, what size works for your fingers, we may have to explore. So hopefully you have a few rubber bands. So if I put the rubber band on my thumbs, it's easy to twiddle. I'm gonna go back to the black shirt. 
So practice again forwards and backwards. And the wonderful thing is that the rubber band does not slip. It just sticks to you like a pulley. There's no sliding. And try it again with a different finger. Choose any finger you like, forwards and backwards. Great. OK, now for two fingers at the same time, if I do this, the rubber band goes around both of them. Now, this is the thing where the thumbs are going clockwise and the index fingers are going clockwise. They're both going clockwise. The thumb goes around both of them. If I want to have the thumbs go clockwise and the index fingers go counterclockwise, it doesn't work smoothly. But if you cross it, so take your thing, cross it like a figure eight, and put the thumb and forefinger into the figure eight, and then from the other side, the thumb and the forefinger also go in. Now with that crossing, I can have my thumbs go clockwise and my index fingers go counterclockwise. So this is the first physical challenge where some people get this instantly and other people say, what is that strange thing supposed to be? I'm not getting it. So I need some feedback. I'm not sure what's the right way for you to feedback, but should I explain this more? Or can you get the idea that the thumbs are going clockwise, the index fingers are going counterclockwise, and the figure eight rubber band is rolling smoothly like on two pulleys. It's like as if your thumbs are clockwise pulley and your index fingers make a counterclockwise pulley. I think I would encourage some of our participants to just use your space bar to jump in. Audrey, you're ready. And you are muted. There we go. Um, what helps me to think about, instead of thinking about clockwise and counterclockwise, which gets me all confused, is to think about go up and to the outside, come back through the middle. Um, yes. So that you can think of it symmetrically that way. Whoops, I can't do it and talk at the same time, though. <laughs> so up, up one to the middle, go around the outside. Between the others, and then two fingers come up through the middle. <clears throat> And then you switch which pair goes up. That's a very good way to think of it. It's a workout. And then reverse it. Two fingers go down through the middle. And then you switch which are the two that are going down. So we want to spend a minute to work on this. And let me say, like many physical things, riding a bicycle or you know, skiing or whatever, some people are going to get it quickly. <clears throat> Other people are going to need to practice a while. And it has nothing to do with how smart you are, or how good you are at some other physical things. Just each physical thing <clears throat> has its own nerve cells in the brain, I think. So maybe I want a show of hands. If everyone wave, can, if you can do it, wave your hand. And if you don't wave your hand, then I should talk a little bit more. OK, so most of you have it. <laughs> okay, um, so let's try generalizing. Can you imagine doing it with a different pair of fingers? What about pink, uh, in index finger and middle finger? <clears throat> let's, oh, let's number the fingers. One, two, three, four, five. Thumb is number one, pinky is number five. So we did one and two. Try two and three. <coughs> this is two and three. Hard to get the different views here. And it's trickier. Your prehensile thumbs have apparently evolved for thumb twiddling in a better way than your middle fingers have. <laughs> nanu, nanu. <laughs> yes, I, I often think of this as a, uh, <coughs> some Vulcan hand signal we just never learned about before. OK, I'm seeing some, uh, some success. Not necessarily now, but at some point in your life, you might want to practice four and five. But it takes a little more dexterity. I haven't done a survey. I would bet if you're a piano player, <coughs> it's easier, but I don't really know. OK, we're coming to the hard part now. We could do any individual finger forward or backwards. 
We learned how to do fingers one and two forwards and backwards. We could do two and three forwards. We can also do them backwards. The challenge is something that uh, I sometimes call the triple twiddle, is to use fingers one, two, and three at the same time. And at first you might feel just completely confused by this, but um, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take my rubber band, cross it to make the figure eight, and then cross it again to make a figure eight, eight. So it's sort of like a double infinity sign. It's, it's, a, it's an extra eight. And I'm using fingers one, two, three of my left hand. Oh, let me go back to the black background. And it's just a single cross like you had between the thumb and forefinger. I'm gonna take three fingers of the other hand, put them in the corresponding hole. So the thumb goes in the thumb hole, the index finger goes in the index finger hole, ring finger goes in the ring finger hole. <clears throat> and the challenge is to go, to, is to do this. <laughs> and I can talk about this a bunch of different ways, but the thumb, but two fingers are doing what two fingers did, whether you take the first two or the second two. And it takes a little practice to do this. Um, when I've done this in like a, a classroom setting, there's a bunch of puzzled looks and people studying their fingers for a while. And then after a few minutes, someone yells, I did it. And then after another while, someone else screams, I've got it. And other people go home frustrated that they didn't get it. Um, but I strongly believe that like riding a bicycle or anything else, <clears throat> you will eventually get it. <clears throat> but I've never done like a longitudinal study to see how long it might take. So just work on that a while while I have a little iced tea. Georgia question, in the four finger version, you pinch the X between the thumb and your forefinger for the starting position. But I'm trying to figure out where <laughs> these three fingers go in terms of what's on this hand, right? That's okay. my starting position, right? Yeah, so we start with a figure eight doubled, or a, right. a three loop eight. Our alphabet does not have a symbol like that. Is that visible? Yes. Okay, so the thumb is sort of in a thumb hole. I'm gonna put the other thumb into that. Ah, adjacent. The index finger is sort of in its own little index finger lozenge. <laughs> the index finger goes into that, and the middle finger goes into the middle. So the fingers can touch each other of the same type. Thumb can touch yeah. thumb. Got it. So the X is not between them, but if they're, got it. <laughs> It's, it's hard to show it from oh. the side, but to go back now, let me, now that we know where we're headed, let's review the basic. With one finger, it's easy to go forward to backwards, <clears throat> no matter which finger you take, two index fingers, two middle fingers, two thumbs. With two fingers, making an eight, I go in the same holes, thumb into thumb, listen to this, oops. And I want to be practice going forwards or backwards. And the forwards, <clears throat> you can think of as just two fingers come up through the middle. I open my fingers and the other two come up. The bottom hand fingers come together and move up through the outer fingers. And that motion is just like two pulleys. The thumbs are like a pulley going clockwise. The index fingers are like a pulley going counterclockwise. And I reverse it just by going down instead of up, down through the middle instead of up. <clears throat> and I imagine that it, it's just like when you cross your hands, some people naturally have one thumb on top, other people have the other thumb on top. <clears throat> I imagine, again, with no proof, I've never done <clears throat> any scientific study of this, but I imagine for some people going one way is gonna be easier than the other way. It just, so if you can't go up, try going down. So Stephen asks in the, uh, in the chat whether it's supposed to feel like the bands are moving. 
Yeah, in fact, let me, that's a great question. I'm gonna take a little Sharpie and put a mark on one. I don't know if you can see that blue mark very well, but yeah. as I move my, as I go through the motion, that blue mark should be going around to show you that the rubber band is smoothly going. Oh, I have to make it on both sides. If it ends up on the inside, you don't see it. Let me try this again. Okay. So there's the blue mark. As, as I do this, it's going around. So you can see the rubber band is smoothly moving. It, it moves like a half inch on every twiddle, every circle. There's no slippage. The rubber band could have infinite friction and this would work fine. <clears throat> and that's sort of the reason why the rubber band helps, I think. It sort of guides your fingers so that one is going clockwise while the other one goes counterclockwise. So do that and then do it on fingers number two and three, index finger and uh, middle finger. Yeah, with this one, I don't feel any of the friction, but then when I add the third finger in, it feels like, like it's slipping. When you, you fold it, you, you twist it once to make the first loop, and then you twist it back to make the third loop? You could twist it clockwise or counterclockwise, it won't matter. It just has to have a half twist each half. time. Not a full 360, just like a half a turn, like you're making a Mobius strip. So with the two, when you're doing it with Go ahead, I, I lost the end of Sorry. Uh, when you're doing it with your thumb and your forefinger, um, you, I'm putting my second two inside touching each other like this. Um, but when you're doing it with three, where, where should I be placing? I can't put them yeah. all next to each other. Where do you put, where do you put them? That's what I would do. So there's like three openings. I'm not sure what I can. If I could point maybe with the pencil so you can see. So here's an opening for my thumb. Mm -hmm. And then there's an opening that my pointer finger is in. And then there's another opening over here <clears throat> that my finger number three is in. Okay. And the corresponding fingers of the other hand go in. So the thumb goes into the thumb hole. Mm -hmm. The pointer goes into the pointer hole. And the middle finger goes into the middle finger hole. So it sounds like the thumb is the only one where your second thumb is to the to the right of it. Yeah, the two thumbs are in the same opening. The two middle fingers are in the same opening, and the two index fingers are in the same opening. Okay, this might be a good point. <clears throat> Let me see. I made a little video. It's all of three minutes, but it has an animation with the side view. Like if I could cut through my fingers <clears throat> and show you you know, what it looks like without my other hand in the way, this would be easier perhaps to visualize the geometry of it. <clears throat> so um, let me see now if I can find my share my screen button here. And share this video. Okay. So someone nod, is this coming through? Yes? yes. Okay. So if you Google George Hart triple twiddle, you'll be able to watch this later. Um, but let me um, let me play just the beginning of this, and then Here's I'll cool stop. Here's a cool thing I want to show you. I call it the triple twiddle. There's a single rubber band moving continuously around three pairs of twiddling fingers. It's fun. I'll teach you how to do it. And I also want to emphasize the idea of abstraction. When I'm twiddling. I see in my mind's eye an abstract triangle of relationships among possible twiddles. And I'll explain that in a minute. But first I'll teach you how to do the twiddle. Get a rubber band and we'll start with the simplest twiddle which just uses one finger. I take the rubber band, put it just on my thumb of one hand, and put the thumb of the other hand in from the other side, and just twiddle your thumbs. The rubber band stays on the outside of your thumbs and goes around smoothly without any slipping, and you can do it in reverse as well. Once you've mastered that, we'll put a half twist in it and do the double twiddle, put the loop on the second finger, put the same two fingers in the same holes from the other side, and I'm twiddling my index fingers in one direction 
my thumbs in the opposite direction. If I focus on just one hand, a pair of fingers moves up between the opening fingers of the other hand. It's a bit tricky at first, but once you do it, you can do it quickly, and you can also do it in reverse. So that's just practice, which is going to help build us up to the triple twiddle. I'm going to take the second loop, add another half twist, put it on my third finger, and take the first three fingers of the other hand, put them in the same holes, and twiddle three fingers at once. Each finger is twiddling in the opposite direction of its neighboring fingers. <coughs> At it, you can all reverse. Now, mathematicians love to generalize. So, what comes next after two fingers and three fingers? Well, you should be able to twiddle with five fingers, two, three, five for prime numbers. Okay, let me pause that. <coughs> and, oops. Stop sharing. Okay. Um, was that helpful? <clears throat> Am I there? Yep. So. Okay. Question? Anybody have a question? Jump on in. So are the when I when I do the three, I'm 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 doing something with my three. I just don't know if it's correct. Is, is it basically the thumb rotating around the thumb, the index rotating around the index, and the uh, ring or the middle rotate? Are they like just rotating around each other? Am yeah. I, is that correct? It's but just opposite directions. The thing is, if seen yeah. from the side, they have to alternate directions clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise. They have to keep switching. Right. Directions. Okay. That's the part where I'm lost. I feel like my fingers are just going around and around. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the cross in between prevents you from doing that. So if I don't cross it, I can go around all the same direction. If I, if I don't cross it, uh, let me, so if, if, I, if I do this, I can go the same direction and presumably you could have, you know, any number of things going around any number of things the same direction. <clears throat> That's not as fun as crossing it and then you have to alternate directions so it doesn't slip. Oh. So if our fingers are going around themselves, thumb over thumb and so on, and we have the rubber band crossed, then we're doing it correctly. Yes, if, if the rubber band isn't yeah. like getting stretched at one spot, if it's rolling like a pulley, like a conveyor belt, you must be doing it correctly. So the question is whether, Brian, you perceive yourself as all the fingers going in exactly the same direction, or whether there is one set of fingers going in an opposite direction, or that each that <laughs> that they are going in opposite directions. That's helpful. Is that helpful? Let me do that I'm not on sure the black can... back. Yeah. So I'm, I have my thumb and forefinger of one hand together. I come through, and then I switch so the thumb and forefinger of the other hand are together. Come through again. I can, let me close this curtain, maybe. Is that better? Yeah. I can see how to twiddle with the rubber band in this position with just doing the four finger twiddle and the two fingers in the end just kind of hanging out. But Wait, I don't understand. You call a four finger twiddle is what I call a two finger twiddle? Two in each hand? Well, I've got six fingers stuck inside this rubber band. Oh, okay. But, and then the first fingers one and two can do their thing. And then finger three is on each hand is kind of at the end saying, what about me? I don't know what to do. Teach me the dance steps. Yeah, so they get a little isolated, the fingers um, at the end as they're going around. They take turns being either isolated or in a pair. So go through, switch, go through, switch. Are, are one and three going the same direction at the same time? Yes, one and three 
go the same way. So every other one will be the same. Not that I can do that yet either, but. No. <laughs> um, if I focus and concentrate, I can do four fingers like very slowly, but I have to, you know, like tell myself, move left, move right. Um, and I've been doing this for years and I've never gotten to five fingers. So I, I totally sympathize with how you likely feel about three fingers. It's probably frustrating, but I can assure you it will, it will work because I've had many people tell me that eventually they got it to go. All right. So George, oh, go ahead, Nakomo. I was gonna say, I find that it's helpful to just make sure I keep the rubber band as close to the edges of my fingers as possible because they end up the closer they get to my knuckles the more difficult it is. Hmm, okay. But, yeah, I guess I'd probably do that. I never really thought about it, but that, that sounds like a good tip. Keep keep it near the uh, fingernails. In the chat, Karen had said that she finds it easier to use fingers two, three, and four. And I just tried that and I think I can do it that way. But I don't oh. think I was doing it properly with my thumb. <laughs> Let me uh I know I, at one time I was pretty good at two, three, and four. I think it's easier for me to visualize from the top, looking down at my fingers. I really should have practiced this before <laughs> going live, <laughs> but it's always good for, as a teacher, to try and learn something that's really hard for you. Um, that's sort of a side benefit of this, so that you really feel frustrated and then you know how your students feel when they say, oh, no, just, you know, divide both sides by X or whatever. And it's like, how did you know to do that? How, how? Like, you make it seem so easy sometimes. <laughs> so this might be a class in empathy instead of a class in rubber bands, and that would be fine, too. I also thought two, three, and four were easier when I thought we were all going in the same direction. So I didn't realize you were pinching and having counter circles. Mm-hmm. Okay, anyway, there's a lot of combinations. So, so let me um, get to one other thing. Uh, and as I said, it, it may take you just a lot of practice to, to improve it, but what is the right practice to do for what? So um, there's a way of thinking about all these different thumb twiddles, which to me is kind of interesting, um, that again shows how mathematicians try to abstract about things. So mathematicians are always looking for different kinds of structures and relationships and connections between things, often lying behind the surface. So um, what I wanna say is that there's a, a kind of a, a relationship between all different sorts of twiddles in terms of what should I practice for what. So if, in order, if, you, can practice, if you can twiddle thumb and forefinger, then you can certainly twiddle just the thumb or just the forefinger. Somehow those two are prerequisites. There's something extra about coordination, but the subtwiddles are kind of a substructure that you need for the larger twiddle. And in the same way, twiddling two is a substructure for what it takes to twiddle three. And if I wanted to twiddle fingers, say four, five, and six, I would first of all, oh, I don't have six, <laughs> three, four, and five, I would first have to twiddle <laughs> fingers three and four. And to twiddle fingers three and four, I had to twiddle figure, finger three. Um, so there's a relationship of what connects to what. But I don't have to twiddle, say, fingers one and five to twiddle fingers one, two, three, four, five. That's not sort of a, a relevant subset. So what is the structure of, of what's necessary to do? Or to think of it one way, if I wanted to learn one hard twiddle, what are the easier ones I should learn first? And to learn those, what are the even easier ones I learn first until I go down to sort of the atomic one finger twiddles. And um, mathematicians have a, a kind of a structure that's something called a, a directed acyclic graph, a DAG it's called, um, which just means I have a bunch of circles and arrows and some point to others. So let me show you the next two minutes of this video, which shows um, this directed graph of what twiddles do you need to do before you do other twiddles. Uh, see if this works. Where was I? And I'll just play it from here. Or you could generalize to different pairs of fingers, like these two fingers, or what's hardest for me, the last two fingers. Now, what was that abstract triangle I mentioned? If you can twiddle three fingers, then you can twiddle the first two of those three, or the last two of those three. 
And this suggests in my mind's eye, a structure of possible twiddles and the relationships between them. This structure is a triangle. At the top of the triangle, I see the five finger twiddle. If I could twiddle all five fingers, then I should be able to twiddle the first four or the last four of those five. And if I can twiddle four, then I can twiddle the first three or the last three of those four, etc., down to the bottom of the triangle, which shows the five different one finger twiddles. So this abstract set of relationships is a structure which I keep in my mind's eye that guides me if I want to know what should I practice if I want to build up to a more complex twiddle. This sort of abstract thinking lets you see deeper into everything around you. It's the essence of real mathematics. It's an example of how mathematicians think differently. Think about that. Okay, stop sharing and I'm back. <clears throat> okay, so I would love to get some feedback from you guys. Is this interesting? Is this something you would consider bringing to students in some context? Maybe not a classroom, maybe a, you know, after school math club if there was such a thing as school anymore or do you do you see this as relevant to mathematics or just weird or what, what are your thoughts? Go this ahead and oh yeah, go ahead, Stephen. I was gonna say this would be a really neat warm up activity, um, just because rubber bands are so easy to do, and because it's not uh, like there's one real right answer. You could be fidgeting multiple fingers. You could be doing one or two fingers at a time. You could be finding your own patterns. But I like this. Okay, great. What, what, at what grade level do you teach? Six and seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, other thoughts? I feel like this could actually be a pretty good tool for helping kids uh, stay focused. I'm a special ed teacher, and I could see kids having this kind of going on under their desks. Or for kids with ADHD who need to pay attention to like 20 billion different things at once, there's enough to work with here that they could do that and kind of keep themselves themselves interested, but also pay attention to what you're doing in class without say throwing things or talking with their neighbor. Hmm. Okay, great. I agree. I think it could be a really fun team building activity and a great way for kids to kind of develop a sense of comfort talking to their peers where there's not one correct answer. They can just kind of play around and explore and see what's going on with these. I think it'd be great for that. Yeah, what, what you said about team building, um, in, in a normal context, if you weren't all in your own separate living rooms, <clears throat> um, in a classroom, well, once person gets it, they show it to their neighbors. So there's sort of a, they get to be the expert in that particular thing and, you know, become the center and, and teach their friends, uh, which adds a social aspect, uh, which we're not able to do here, but I, I've, I've certainly seen in, in uh, group settings. It reminds me of, I was a musician all through school, and so it reminds me of, like, my, my teacher would make me learn how to de beat different um, different patterns on both hands at the same time. Um, and it really reminds me of like learning how to beat like three beats on this hand versus four beats on this hand. You know, like it's a very similar sort of mental process it feels like. Yes, I, I totally agree. So I, I played the piano, you know, my whole life. And I, I'm very familiar with sort of the kinds of exercises and things that seem incredibly difficult when you're learning and then eventually your fingers sort of <clears throat> master it and it's it's something that happens, you know, like bicycle riding. You can't consciously explain everything your body is doing. It just comes out right eventually, and then you, you practice and it gets better. Um, this has very much of that feel, and that's why I don't know to what extent it's, it's you know, perhaps frustrating. It's always important never to frustrate your students too much, but you want to frustrate them a little bit so they feel like they're, they're learning and they're growing. Um, so... Uh, that's just a warning that's, that some students might come out of this feeling like I can't do it and you have to somehow make them not feel bad. I teach at one of the citywide gifted schools and um, you know our kids run a, a gamut but some of them are it's interesting they mess up all the time in arithmetic but their grasp of big concepts is can be extraordinary and I'm always trying to teach them that math is it's not that we didn't create math math exists in the world and what we've done is find ways to just to notice the patterns and to describe what's going on so i love examples that show them that math isn't just adding and multiplying and dividing on a page 
that math exists in so many different forms, and particularly for the ones who are who have very high potential mathematically, it's good for them to understand that there's all sorts of interesting, fascinating things that lie ahead of them, so that they don't turn off to math now and think that oh, it's it's boring. Yes, so we'll do our best so that it's not boring. That, that's that's a wonderful lesson, which I I think uh, things like YouTube are are gradually teaching the uh, the populace. But you know, traditionally people thought of arithmetic as mathematics because they learned that arithmetic and that was called math. And to me, the best thing people could do is stop calling arithmetic math. Just say that's arithmetic, yeah. and when you get older, we'll start teaching you some math, which involves a lot of other fun subjects um, besides arithmetic. And the, the sequence that kids see, you know, this algebra and trigonometry and calculus, um, that's a crucial sequence which you need to get through to get in college to sort of understand differential equations, which, which are essential for engineering and economics and science and, and many things. But that's the, only the slightest little bit, one route through all of mathematics. And nowadays, people through YouTube, I think, see, you know, combinatorics and probability and graph theory and group theory and and they see that there's much more to math. And if you could teach them that math is really about patterns and structures of any sort, uh, you're doing them a great favor to sort of awaken them to, to see that there's more than just arithmetic. I think there's some discussion to be had too with the kids about like breaking something down into a smaller problem. Like you couldn't initially twiddle three fingers all at the same time, but you could do two and how does that relate and then possibly even in the current situation we're in where they're on zoom um you know having them teach a sibling or teach a parent or and come back to class and explain well, what did you need to do in order to communicate with this this to the other person how did you have to break it down um did you switch to the three middle fingers which i found to be easier and looking at it down from the top or you know, what, what adaptations did you have to do in order to uh, get the concept across to another person and hear what they have to say about that? Because those are all skills that they need also. Yeah, anything that helps them become aware of how they learn, I think, uh, aware of how they can solve problems is, is a, the general problem solving skill that's gonna help them throughout their life. And, and math class has the greatest potential for, for giving kids practice in, in you know, facing a tough problem and letting them try all different things and thinking of how they learn and uh, giving them that joy of the aha of solving things. Well, I also like that sometimes with a problem like this, the kid who gets it is not the kid who gets everything else right away. And it makes a different kid feel really good because that kid becomes the expert. Yes, I totally have seen that again and again and again. Um, so I do a lot of hands-on building constructions. I, you've probably seen on my website. I also have a, a website with my wife called Making Math Visible. <clears throat> and it's just full of dozens of hands-on activities of making something cool. Um, and again and again, there's, um, there are kids who are not the star in a traditional math setting who get the visual pattern, they get the hands-on aspect, um, it could be that they're good with rubber bands or, or whatever it is. Uh, they get to shine for that moment in math class. And I think that has a, a wonderful sort of effect on, on positive self-esteem. There is a, a post in the chat, George, that asks whether you might be willing to show teachers how to make the worm. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, so I, I'd be very happy to. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think you all received a link to a, a, a paper I wrote for a conference a few years ago, which is online. Just came out in a book, actually, this month. I haven't actually received the book. Um, but it has three different rubber band activities. The one I showed you just now, the triple twiddle, in, in that paper is called uh, Infinity Squared. Um, it's the hardest one of the three. The worm uh, is another one. I'm very happy to show you the worm. Um, you want to take a rubber band and uh, it works best with a thin one. So uh, like not one of these thick ones, certainly not your broccoli kind of rubber band, but um, <laughs> the, th the thinner ones work well. Even a very thin one uh, will work. I'll, I'll, I'll take this size because I happen to have a bunch here. For the worm, <clears throat> what you want to end up is uh, you want to twist it between your fingers <clears throat> and I'm twisting it just rolling it between my thumb and forefinger. 
<clears throat> so that it gets lots and lots of twists in it. And if I was to let go, it would untwist and become a mess. So I won't let go. I'm going to twist it. <clears throat> and I have to use my thumb and forefinger to keep it uh, from untwisting. <clears throat> so if you think about it, one, is, one half is twisted all the way clockwise. The other one is twisted a lot counterclockwise. Does that make sense? Then there's a little dexterity <clears throat> to try and bring the, the centers that I'm holding to keep it from untwisting, bring them together in one hand. <clears throat> so now I'm able to let go. I've got all the counterclockwise below and all the clockwise above. It looks something like a mess. Um, but again, if I was to let go, it would all cancel out and you'd go back to an ordinary rubber band. And now I can kind of stretch it out and make one end look kind of neater. And now we'll do it over here. Kind of get in there, stretch it out, and roll it back. So now one end is, is crossed. If, if you ever play with like uh, balsa paper airplanes, that, that balsa wood airplanes that have a, a propeller, you may have run, wound up rubber bands very tight. <clears throat> so after they twist, the kind of a twist built on top of the twist, you get sort of a second level helix. Uh, that's what's happening here. And that's good. So that's um, the basic structure of the worm, <clears throat> except I can never let go of this without it exploding. So then the next bit of dexterity is to somehow stretch it and to get a knot in the middle of it without ever letting go too much. So I've, I managed to tie an overhand knot and then snug that up tight. And now because there's a knot in the middle, it cannot cancel out. So now I can straighten it and kind of make this end look very neat. My other end's already kind of neat. And so now I have this wormy looking thing <clears throat> and one part <clears throat> is all clockwise, the other part's all counterclockwise and the little knot in the middle, which if you pull it really tight, becomes so small that people don't see it. And now if you show this to someone and you say, you know, can you untwist it or whatever, uh, it doesn't, it no longer will untwist. So anyway, that's the worm. Nothing too deep about it. It's just kind of a, a fun exercise in wasting a rubber band when you're born. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think we should uh, spend a few minutes in small groups digesting what you've just done. Um, thinking about uh, how you might take this back to your classrooms. So I posed a few questions in the email that you received this morning, asking you if there was anything in the two-pager that we didn't get to today that you might want to discuss, anything you'd like to talk about further that came up in this presentation, and how you might take this into the classroom. So we're gonna take uh, about 10 minutes and George will join one or more of these groups. I have him assigned to one now and George, you can pop out and go into another if you'd like. And we'd like to ask the uh, person whose, uh, whose last name falls closest to the end of the alphabet to facilitate this conversation. But before we do that, we will need to say goodbye to those of you who are watching on live stream. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation and we thank you very much for being here.